Brigadier General James Archer has ridden ahead and joined Major Harry Gilmore and his cavalry troopers to survey the Union battle line. There is an awful lot of open ground to cross should he choose to attack. This is what he has with which to face the Union troops. You will remember that the 7th Tennessee Regiment was left behind at Parksville to guard the Union prisoners and bury the dead. All his units are at full strength. He has three infantry, two cavalry and one artillery battery. He will be facing double the infantry regiments he currently commands. Granted, some of the Union reserves are depleted. The two forces are equal in artillery and his cavalry outnumber the Union by two to one. Even with depleted reserves of infantry, the Union line looks formidable. As the aggressor, the rebels are obliged to attack. Brigadier Joe Davis with his brigade of four regiments of infantry and an artillery battery are en route north to join Archer's brigade, but are still some hours away and would likely only arrive as dust fell, probably too late to take part in any fighting. I must admit, I spent a long time looking at the tabletop and pondering the options. My eyes were being continually drawn to the mass ranks of blue and the wide open space the rebels would have to cross. Even if they made it to musket range, they would not be able to move and fire in that same turn. So the Union battle line would have, in essence, a free shot. Then if in the following turn, in the initiative roll went in favour of the Union, they would again be able to pour a second volley into the brigade's ranks. What would be left after that? True, even if they waited for Davis and his brigade, that ground would still have to be covered, and with it, the carnage that was sure to bring. But with the second wave, then at least a sacrifice would hopefully not be in vain, as the second wave troops would then still be in good shape to fall upon the enemy. The only flying ointment in waiting for Joe Davis was that even though it was still in the same t it's still the same table, another day would have passed, and then the lottery of rolling for reinforcements could immediately bolster the Union ranks, but add nothing to the rebels. General Archer's luck holds. No reinforcements this turn for either side. Brigadier General Barlow, Officer Commanding First Division, had two messages on the table before him. One from Aid Ames, his second brigade commander, the other from his boss, Major General Oliver Howard, commanding officer of 11 Corps. Aid was once more asking for more reinforcements to stop the rebel advance up the Crooked Valley. The Confederate forces in the valley could not amount to more than a brigade. Even the reports of enemy numbers provided by Ames himself gave weight to that argument. At this moment, the two of his brigades were involved in stopping this incursion. Surely that was enough. His eyes moved to the other message. His boss was pre-warning him that 1st Division would shortly be receiving orders to move to rejoin 11 Corps. The whole Army of the Potomac was moving north in an attempt to keep pace with Bobby Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. He got to his feet and walked over to a huge map on the wall. Could the enemy spare a force any larger than a brigade to cause mischief in the valley? Bobby Lee was already outnumbered. Well, so far, that brigade was tying down two of his. Maybe that was the plan, prevent his division from joining the rest of the army. He would not allow that to happen. He would have to make do with what he already had. His two brigades should be more than ample for the task. Aid and Leo, the two Union Brigade commanders and their men, had been stood in battle formation for nearly three hours. It was now approaching 1800 hours. They'd seen plenty of movement down the valley, troops of cavalry appearing and disappearing, all well out of range of the artillery. Occasionally units of infantry would be seen marching up to the top of the escarpments, only to march away again. It would appear our friends have no intention of giving battle today, Leopold von Gilser, commander of 1st Brigade, said. 
The enemy commander was seeing the size of our combined force and decided against action. To my reckoning, that confirms the force opposing us is just that small brigade you fought last night. He has not been reinforced. Adelben Ames tugged on his beard. You may be right, my friend. He would have surely attacked by now. He was actually pleased that no attack had come. His brigade and the two units of Leo's brigade that had marched through the previous night were all dog-tired. Many had not slept for over 36 hours, or, or had managed at most a couple of hours sleep. Perhaps he wants us to strike against him, then it would be our boys that would have to cover that open ground. Leo shook his head. We were not giving him that advantage. If he wants to continue up the valley, he will have to push us aside first. I suggest we put out strong patrols and stand the men down. They can eat and catch some much needed sleep. The onus is on the enemy to attack us. Let us wait and see what he does in the morning. By the morning our strength will have grown. My request for reinforcement should, be, should see at least one more brigade join us during the night, whilst the enemy will hopefully receive none. If that is the case, then if he does not offer battle, we will go on the offensive and drive him back down the valley. At that very moment, Joe Davis's brigade was just two, hour, two hours away south. The following morning, both armies rose and took their place in their respective battle formations. The Union brigades formed up much as they had the day before. They had no reason to alter anything. Brigadiers Archer and Davis, after studying the ground at First Lake, decided to put the plan of attack they had decided upon last night into effect. As Joe remarked, a slice of deception never goes amiss. If you can fool the enemy and keep him guessing, you maintain the initiative. To all intents and purposes, the rebel force looked exactly as the Union commanders had hoped and expected. The only addition appeared to be an extra battery of artillery. Both Aid and Leo were puzzled by this development. Had the enemy delayed his attack to gain just a single battery of guns? A raid out of sight behind the Confederate battle line stood four more battalions of infantry. Their presence would be soon be felt as the, as the deception plan unfolded that morning. The Confederates win the initiative. The 1st Maryland and 2nd Virginia Cavalry advance at the gallop, the former then dismounting and moving into the woods, the latter taking up position in the cover of the trees. On the Confederate right flank, the eastern escarpment, General Archer and the 5th Alabama advance. Hoogers and the Louisiana batteries engage in long-range counter-battery fire. At long range, each battery rolls half dice, but Hooger's scores a hit. A blue disc for G battery, US artillery. From the opposite flank, Brigadier General Ames could see the rebel cavalry galloping along the escarpment towards the woods. He was not going to let them damn rebels do what they did at the Hog River again. He sent a hurried note by courier warning the 41st New York that the enemy had entered the woods in front of them. They were to enter the wood and clear it of the enemy and then hold it. 5th Michigan Cavalry were ordered forward to face the oncoming rebel regiment. They would dismount and act as pickets in an attempt to weaken and disorder the enemy. As half strength and firing at long range, the artillery roll, they only get a single die against the rebel artillery. The Donaldsville, Louisiana artillery is the target, but on this occasion, without any success. A bird's eye view of the situation after the first time. Fifth Alabama watched the approach of the enemy cavalry. 
the 11th and 42nd Mississippi hold their positions. The Union generals had no idea these two units formed part of Joe Davis's 4th Brigade. They were seeing what they expected to see, the original Rebel Brigade. The first Maryland troopers moved stealthily through the trees, seen from the position held by the 2nd Virginia Cavalry. The 41st New York moved steadily toward the wood. The Union troops are feeling reasonably confident at the moment, no masked ranks of the enemy ahead. General Ames, in among the soldiers of the 107th Ohio and the 153rd Pennsylvania, is also confident that everything is in hand. The enemy artillery is a concern, but other than that, he was satisfied. Initiative role goes to the Union. After advancing along the escarpment, 5th Michigan dismount and form up. At the same time, 41st New York reached the tree line on the opposite flank. More counter battery fire, but once again it is unsuccessful. The 5th Michigan are now in position to open up with carbine fire when the enemy infantry move into range. Troopers of the 1st Maryland Cavalry, now of course Miners Howe, wait silently and pick targets among the advancing 41st New York. 5th Alabama move into small arms range. Once again, both rebel batteries concentrate on their sole and weakened opposite number with more than enough success. G battery is no more. Once again, the Union win the initiative. 41st New York advance carefully into the wood. 5th Michigan engage 5th Alabama with carbine fire and one hit is registered. A blue disc for the Alabamians but of course very soon they will get their chance to return fire. 1st Maryland troopers engage the 41st New York with carbines and miss with a lot. It's times like this when you wish Hal was still with you. Both Confederate batteries now turn their attention to the massed ranks of the enemy infantry. 2nd Virginia, no longer in danger of fabling the firing arc of their artillery, are able to advance. Joe Davis accompanies the 11th and 42nd Mississippi as they advance towards the enemy. The Alabamians score two hits on the troopers of the 5th Michigan. I've just noticed the flag. They should also have fallen back one moment. Long range artillery fire scores hits and a fall, two hits and a fall back. The 17th Connecticut take one hit, as do the 25th Ohio, the latter also falling back. Troopers of the 1st Maryland score two hits and a fall back on the 41st New York. The shock 41st New York are pushed out of the wood. The scene at the end of this turn. Brigadier General James Archer is more than satisfied at the moment, as is his corps commander, Joe Davis. The 41st New York face enemy cavalry both ahead and now dangerously close on their flank. Things are not going too well for the Union, but even so, they still have the advantage of numbers, or so they think. 
the deception plan of the rebels is about to be sprung. <laughs>